Hello, so, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Roger Ewan with Fort Brand. Uh, I've been dealing with the bombs of COVID for over 22 years now. Uh, I had uh, 10 years experience at the Calgary Airport Authority working in airport operations. So I'm very familiar with what you guys actually have to try to accomplish on the field and the conditions you have to deal with, as well as uh, mechanics and, and what they have to deal with with regards to supporting the equipment. Um, I'd just like to begin with uh, initial discussion with regards to the current bombs equipment that you guys have. You have two generations here. The first generation will be the Scania machines with the older CAN panel. Second generation you have uh, part well the, the, the Caterpillar engine machine which has the AM and T in it. Then the next generation is going to be the Volvo engines with the AM and T and now we've got this generation with the new cab, new can system. So those are two of the biggest changes to this whole system. Other than that, the plow, the broom, the hitch, all that stuff is pretty much identical to the original cab, uh, Volvo engine machine you received the last couple of years. So you've, some of you have been operating them already. Now, have all, all you guys actually run the Bobbins machine? Is there any things that you don't like or things that you like or questions you have with regards to what you're currently doing or trying to do with those machines? Just got a question. All right, then we'll go through this, uh, the newer model one here to give you an idea what's going on. We'll take you through the reasons why uh, we do what we do at Vama. It's a little bit different than everybody else, so hopefully this helps you guys understand some of the why and the how of the Vama's equipment. Today we're going to be talking specifically about the Vama's PSB, which is a plow sweeper blower. 5,500 or 5.5 meter wide machine, which is 18 feet. Um, <clears throat> there's different, <coughs> the, the FAA has a lot of these equipment. We are considered an MTE, which is a multitasking equipment. So we can do three or more functions at once, at the same time in one chassis. Uh, there's different models. Your MBs out there are tow behinds that are considered a modular configuration. Uh, the Bahamas PSB is continued, considered an articulating configuration so that uh, basically the, the rear articulates instead of having a, a pintle hitch or a fifth wheel hitch between the two. Uh, they're connected directly with hydraulics so you don't have to worry about backing up that trailer and trying to move that around. It's all connected as one unit. Um, what I hope to cover today is going to be the safety systems are on board. Pre-trip inspections, now each facility has a different procedure with regards to pre-trip inspections and or who does them. Uh, here I believe the operators do your pre-trip inspections. Some facilities, a mechanical group does it. Usually sometimes a combination of the two and or, but either way, whatever procedures you guys have already got in place for your current vomit fleet would be sufficient for what we've been doing. Operational aspects of the PSB, so understanding the machine, the why and the how it works. Understanding the CAN system, the CAN system is the brains of the machine, that's where all the diagnostics is done. That's what allows us to work everything automatically from one joystick as opposed to having multiple joysticks in the cabin. Operating system sequencing, getting the plow, the broom, and the air blower to all function together every time consistently. <coughs> that's the way the VAMAS is designed. We'll show you how to get to that point. Adjusting the plow and the broom. Locations of the fire extinguishers, emergency stop buttons, uh, main power disconnect is located at a different location on these machines than you've had in the past. The safe distance of operation, of course, if you're actually going to do some testing or operating of the machine itself in a parked area or with vehicles and people around, you should be aware of your surroundings. Uh, emergency stops and fire extinguishers. We've got one emergency stop located inside the cabin on the new model. Uh, it's on the front side of the joystick controller. We have a fire extinguisher located underneath the passenger seat. <coughs> Uh, that conveniently now the fire extinguisher is actually written in English as opposed to Finnish, so that will help you a lot if you need to be. Uh, the rear dis main disconnect for the power is located inside this box, this red knob up in the top here, is located in the left rear of the machine in that center door, so you pop that open, you open up this door here and you'll see the main power disconnect. You also see your, your uh, NATO plug up here that you can plug machine to machine and boost them. I believe Keith has a plug you can move from one machine to another and boost them uh, as required. Um, emergency stop buttons are located one on each side of the rear, which is exactly the same as all your previous Vamos machines. Those are the exterior ones. And if you have any questions throughout this, you can, I can pause and we can address the question based on the picture we see. Here's the main electrical power box. Uh, you can see here we've got our mains shut off, we've got the NATO plug. We've got various other electronic components that aren't going to be of interest to the operators themselves. 
But on the door here, there's a little map that tells you exactly what's inside each panel of the Bionics machine. So from a mechanical perspective, you can actually open the door and see what everything is, all the components are, what you're looking at, understand it a little bit more clearly. Some of the dimensions of the machine, uh, our plow is a 27 foot cutting edge or a 30 foot plow overall. We're dealing with a, a, the plow itself is at a 37 degree angle. So we're a little more aggressive than everybody else. The plow clears about 22 feet wide by itself. The broom is a 22 foot broom angled at 35 degrees that sweeps 18 feet up the back. So that 18 feet that swept up the back of the machine is considered the production of this machine, which is actually 5.5 meters, hence the PSB 5500. So that's how the size and concept always comes into play. The plow should always be larger than the broom to keep the windrow away from the broom itself so it's not uh, causing the broom to stall or get into any implications of windrow or size of windrow into the broom itself. You always want the plow to be wider. These are all concepts that Vaughn has brought to the North American market back in 1998 when they first started delivering these machines in North America. <coughs> We have uh, front and rear steering as well, so whatever we do in the front happens in the back. You guys have had that feeling when you move the wheel and the back end moves a little bit on you. So we're getting about 36 degrees of swing in the back, left to right. The faster you travel, the more it takes away your rear steering. If you were to drive this machine in a tight circle and pick up speed, the circle would get bigger automatically because it's taking away the rear steering as you travel. It's all done automatically. The transport mode, of course, which you've got in your barn right now, uh, remove the plow, put the broom and transport were about 58 feet long and eight and a half feet wide. So we've driven these, uh, have any of you guys been to the Buffalo Snow Symposium in Buffalo, New York, many times? We drive these machines right down the street in Buffalo, downtown Buffalo, New York, and then drive them into the convention center. And we're worried about the only manufacturer who can literally drive them down the street in the building and set them up in the building and we're done. We don't have to take out a wrench to do anything, it's all ready to go. This is a very good aspect of this articulated type machine. So basically whatever you do in the front is going to happen in the back. The reason I show this picture is because a lot of people get into situations where they could create or cause their own rear steering alarms. The reason you could cause a rear steering alarm is if you've got a difference between your front steering axle and the rear of the machine. A lot of people will move the front axle like they're driving their car. The back end is trying to keep up with whatever you're doing with the steering wheel because that's what it's supposed to do. There's a sensor on the front and a sensor on the back. Those two are always talking. And if one is out of sync with the other or there's a difference between the two, you'll get an alarm to let you know that the back end is not where it's supposed to be. You need to either give us some time to catch up or reset the, 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 the uh, switch, which you guys have all had some experience with, I'm sure. One of the major aspects of the bottom machine is it will turn within 75 feet with the plow on it and the 75 foot wide taxiway, but you've got to turn between the lights, not at the lights, not close to the lights, make sure you're well in the middle of the lights, because with the plow on the broom on the machine itself, it's just that much wider. You need that much more space to make that turn. When you come in to make the turn, you can come in as hot as you want, come in, apply the brakes, get it down to the walking speed, start to make your steering uh, motion with the front, uh, front steering uh, wheel. As you make your front steering, the back end's gonna to try to follow you around that corner. I recommend you come into the turn as hot as you like, but make sure you get it slowed down to almost a walking speed. Start to make your turn slowly. No acceleration on the pedal or slight acceleration, depending on conditions. <clears throat> as you come out of the turn, look at the mirror and watch that back end. Once you see that back end start to straighten out, that's when you can start putting your foot to it. But don't start putting your foot into it in the middle of the turn. I've seen so many people that do that. What that does is I've got 18,000 pounds on the drive axle, or on the front axle, 48,000 pounds and eight tires on the back, trying to keep up with whatever you're doing in the front. So there's a bit of a weight issue there. It's all trying to work together. So the slower and more fluid you can move the wheel, the better and smoother of ride you're gonna get in the cabin and you'll minimize your arms you get overall. So what's trying to happen here in this situation, if you hit the throttle in this situation, your front end wants to be over here. The back end literally wants to be over here somewhere because these wheels want to drive straight ahead. It doesn't know that it's trying to make a turn. So when you come into the turn, make sure you're off the throttle, make the turn, let the wagon follow you around. As the wagon straightens out, coming out of the turn, that's when you can start applying the power again and then push you straight and you'll minimize all the inner any rear steering alarms you may get. Or the twitching, 
If you're in the cab of that seat or cab of that machine, you're getting a lot of movement back and forth, you're doing something wrong. It shouldn't be jumping around like that. Slow down your turn. These machines will operate, and I've heard they're operating speeds that you guys run them at, but I've run these seat machines myself at 45 to 50 miles an hour, easily, while operating. But when you're making that turn, it's down to walking speed. Okay. Any questions on that? Pre-trip inspections, again, the proper circle check to walk around looking for problems or issues that may be there. Make sure your liquids are topped up. Loose or missing items, wheel nuts, stuff like that. Any flanges sticking out or a problem that may occur when trying to just uh, separate from the machine for whatever reason. Or most importantly, any impacts that might have happened because nowadays management is trying to look at machines and manage who's running what, when, and what happened to that machine while they're running it, stuff like that. So they're always trying to change, change that down. So when I do my walk on, I'm looking for any, any damage that might be there or was not there before, let's say. Um, uh, I'm looking for signs of hydraulic leaks. Uh, the Vamos equipment uses a clear hydraulic fluid, so it's not a red one like some of the other manufacturers do, or it looks like it's literally bleeding in the snow. Uh, ours is clear, so it's a little more difficult to spot per se, but it's also a lot more environment friendly. Uh, make sure all your lights are working and in shape and lined correctly. Windshield wipers, that's a big one. Make sure the condition is, is in good condition with the windshield wipers, everything's in place and operational. You have a full deluge system on these machines as well to give you deluge on the windows to help to remove all the, the, uh, the icing fluid that ends up getting on them. Uh, check and recommend tire pressures, make sure they're all good. Again, the wear of the broom bristles and the wear of the cutting edges on the blade themselves. You should make a mental note of that. I don't know, when your guys run machines, are you dedicated to a machine or is it a slip seating? Anybody can run any machine at any time. Dedicated. No, we're assigned to machines. One guy on day, one guy on midnight. Okay, so that's a good, then you can actually, too, you could work out the machine and know who, who does what or who doesn't do what. Yeah, <laughs> either way. <clears throat> the plow design itself. The black plows you see out there, you guys have mostly black plows now. This is where the original design came from. We wanted to develop a plow that was light, but very efficient. This is what the fins came up with. Here's a prime example of this plow, what it's designed to do, which is actually expand on one side and contract on the other side to create or allow a larger flow of snow up and over. We're trying to create this flat windrow in the back as well. So at a high rate of speed, we actually don't leave a windrow like this where the ops people have to report a three foot windrow or a, windrow or a two foot windrow left on the runway. If you're hitting at a speed and the windrow's flatter, the blowers can move faster, the whole team moves faster and more efficiently up and down that runway. That version of runway times are probably around 22 minutes or something like that, is that correct? We've got other facilities that are doing five runways in one hour with the bottomless machines and they're doing each runway in 10 minutes. One thing that concerned me, I'll just mention to you guys, that concerned me is the amount of idling time you guys have. I understand they'll take the machines on the other side of the field and they say they get trapped over there and they end up sitting on the other side of the field idling for hours. Uh, that's not a really good plan per se. I don't understand they're trying to work with FAA and operations and all that, but get the machines on the field, do the job, get them off the field, and then wait for the next opportunity to get back out there again and then make your circuit. And if you want to discuss that further, I can tell you what they're currently doing in Toronto because that's the place where they're doing five runways of one hour, every hour on the hour. So they control the field, not the airlines or the, or, or the there is now Canada or FAA. Because ultimately it's the airport that's responsible for the surface, not the airlines. The plow hitch itself, you can see that the very robust plow hitch is probably the strongest in the industry. One of the secrets of the model's machine is that it allows us to have a larger hitch on the front, more weight on the front axle because all the engines are in the back, all the big weights behind you. We are not close to overweight on our front axle. That's part of the reasoning. Uh, I believe uh, there's been minimal problems with this hitch. It's worked really well for us. We upgraded it probably 15 years ago, I think it was, and uh, it, we really found a, a good, strong hitch. Uh, we use a solid steering or, uh, cylinder to turn the plow head left and right. It's not a telescopic one where you'll see different sections that come out and come back in. It's all one solid piece. So again, it adds to our strength. We have something called plow softening on our plow. So you'll see the plow literally go all the way to the right, come back a little bit, go all the way to the left and come back a little bit. That's there to act as a shocking mechanism against ice windrows or anything that you might impact on the field to give you a little bit of a cushion on the whole mechanism itself. 
So you won't see any rubber stoppers anywhere, any of that stuff, and you won't feel the impact of the machine as much, but you will see these cylinders move in and out depending on the load that you have on the plow itself. Speaking of the plow, I just want to go back to this one quick picture here if I can. Uh, when you get a new operator in a bombless machine, they want to get in an operating seat and they think the windrow <coughs> for the plow is going to be in the center. That's where you want to pick up the windrow from the machine in front of you. On the bombless machine, that windrow is out here. That's a full bite on those plows and they like a full bite. They don't like to take half a bite or double cuts, they like a full bite. So if you've got four inches of snow out there, three inches of snow, two inches of snow, whatever it may be, and you're pushing from the last guy in the back, the last guy should be taking a full cut as best he can to load up that whole plow, that frame and the plow hitch as one, as opposed to just taking a little tiny piece off the end because that mechanical advantage just works on that plow itself. So a full bite is what these machines like. Do you guys do any straight plating? Is it in apron areas or is it in intersections or both? Intersection. Uh, straight blading obviously can be done. It's a good idea to do when you're crossing an intersection or another taxiway. You can straighten the blade manually and carry it with you as you go across and then put it to the right and dump it on your side. That's a good way to do it. Now trying to get your whole team to do that is a challenge sometimes. Do you guys do a flying V more than a one way type of action or? One way. One way. Okay. Yeah. That's that's. If you're doing it, if you're out there fast enough, that's a good a good application. If you start getting behind and the weights get to be too much snow on the field, then you got to split it to, to take the density to the right and to the left, and then that that's a different plan. We got one. Yeah. Oh, you got crosswinds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the wind is going to be out here on these plows. Take a full bite. If you get to the condition where you take too much snow on the plow, I've seen the guys, particularly in Boston, like to do that, where they load up the plow and the, the springs, instead of being like this on the plow, will look like this, because they put too much snow into the plow and expand it as a, as a straight plow as opposed to an angle. This plow is designed to move at a high speed at an angle. That's its most efficient position. Uh, one of some of the main differences, I know I've seen the guys, mostly MV plows that I see out there now, but they run perpendicular to the surface or straight the 90 degrees to the surface. So what they're really doing is just pushing the snow along. And when you push the snow along, you can see it kind of pile up on the edge here, like this piles up on the whole thing. If you get some speed, you might actually get it to roll a bit, but you gotta have a, quite a bit of speed to make it actually work. Our plow is a completely different design. We're attacking the, plow, uh, the snow at a 45 degree angle trying to get the snow up and inside the plow because that's where it moves the most. Our plow being at 37 degrees allows us to, to take less horsepower to move more snow like a boat going through the water. So that's one of the, another one of the secrets of the bottomless machine is that it's allowed to cut through the snow as opposed to push through the snow. Um, we have a flexible mold board on top. This whole plow itself weighs 3,000 pounds. The guy over here is probably 5,000 pounds. So you got a lot more weight on the nose, you got a lot more you gotta push. Uh, so all that stuff comes into play to make our plow a little a lot more efficient in the deeper snow conditions. A 45 degree cutting edge trying to get the snow up and into the plow as opposed to just pushing it along. Segment of design, so each segment goes over the in-pavement light. I'm sure you've heard the duh, 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 as you go over the, the in-pavement lights. That one section is moving up and down, the rest of them are staying on the surface. So the light itself does not take as much impact as it does with this style. You've got a 5,000 pound plow with a poly cutting edge hitting that light. And if I put a rock under here, that whole plow would be off the ground based on that rock. <coughs> so every time it's hitting an in pavement light, that whole thing is going up and down. Unless you have it off the ground, which is, I don't know if you guys run them off the ground or not, but we run our, we like to run ours flush on the ground. <coughs> We have a trailing caster wheel. <clears throat> what that allows us to do is our pivot for the caster wheel is here, our axle is there. The, the distance between here and there is called trailing. So if that is the greater that distance, the more the caster wheel is going to trail every time as opposed to fight it or wobble. So we have that concept on the plow, we have that concept on the broom, uh, which allows us to travel at higher rates of speed with no caster wheel wobble. And there's also one caster wheel as opposed to two. So the two aren't fighting each other all the way down the runway or taxiway, whichever you got. So ours, cast well, if your experience has been, 
with this plow and the new broom design, there's not a lot of wobble or vibration that's happening on those machines. Centering caster wheel. Our cast wheels do not spin 360 degrees. Theirs do, ours does not. Uh, the reason being is we want the cast wheel again to be moving forward at a higher rate of speed. So when you pull back the joystick and the plow is angled, the cast wheels automatically spring back to the center position. So whenever you put the plow on the ground, they're only going halfway to whichever angle they need to be as opposed to being completely out of circle and getting snapped around and potentially ripping the cast wheel right off. So I've seen that happen on some of the other ones. That's worked pretty well for us. Now with this thing, this, this uh, trailing caster wheel, you can't back up with the plow on the ground because the caster wheels will do one of these, the broom will do one of those. So when you put it in reverse, give it a second to let the plow come up. It does it automatically. The plow comes up, the broom comes up, and allows you to back up. Now the way I look at it is, if you're backing up on the airfield, you've done something wrong. Because really, we're always moving in a forward direction, always working with the snow. I've seen some facilities that like to push in the corner and back up, push in the corner and back up, and like that stuff from the 80s. I can do much more with this, with my plow manual button, than you can with the standard plow pushing up into the corner. I can go into an intersection and have all the snow piled from that intersection on one side, so the blower makes one pass and he's done, as opposed to four passes on every corner. Our cutting edge itself, again, the segment of design, independent cutting edges. You can see a little spring in the back here. Allows the cutting edge to move up and down and go over, designed to go over the end pavement legs. Here's a good shot of the plow testing when they originally designed it. They put it on a truck chassis here and they ran it at high rates of speed. You can see the actual wave inside that starts. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Once we get it rolling like this, it comes off that end pretty fast. So I don't know if you guys have been on the tail end of your conga line in a wet slushy situation you see that snow coming off that plow, it goes quite a distance. So you really have to adjust your speed accordingly or your load accordingly depending how close you are to the edge lights because the amount of volume coming off that plow can, and I've seen break the flangible couplings on the lights on the runway and stuff like that because it's coming off too hard and too fast. So that's something the tail gunner has to be aware of. You can see it doesn't take much. Any human can stand up there and push this off. I'm sure you've seen these things flapping in the wind. They look really fragile, but at the end of the day, they're probably one of the most robust plows out there. We've got probably 12, 13 years on this plow design, and it's all over North America and Europe on the bottles machines. Uh, the broom itself, you guys run a cassette star, sorry, wafer style broom. It's got a single motor drive at one end. It's got a solid core all the way to the other end. The whole broom can spin at about 720 RPM at full speed. It increases speed automatically. The faster you drive the machine, the faster the broom goes automatically. One of the things I like to keep a close eye on as an operator is your gap between the spoiler and the brush right here. On the older Bombas machines, we like that gap to be about a finger width. On these larger broom diameter machines, you can have like a full hand width in between there. It doesn't really seem to matter as much as it does on the older ones. Uh, but we don't want that spoiler getting into the brush. If it's getting into the brush, A, you're making too many adjustments, or B, the machine is making too many adjustments. So that means we have to slow the adjustment process down, just keep it more at speed with the brush wear itself. Now from a mechanic's perspective, they would go inside and change the actual broom life hours of the brush. Right now, the new, broom, new machines we got out there, their life hours of the bristle are set at 70. So it knows it's 1170 millimeters in diameter. It will make the pulses based on that diameter and the 70 hours that you want to get out of that brush. So if we find the spoilers getting into the brush too much, then we back those hours off. We set them to 80 to 100. I know I'm running at about 150 in Toronto right now. That's a sweet spot we found with any running a set broom, not a wafer. Uh, but the, uh, that's the sweet spot where that spoiler maintains distance, the pattern's always there and the operators are making an adjustment maybe once every 12 hours. So that's, that's where we want to be. The operators aren't focused on that broom pattern all the time. When you make an adjustment with the, with the broom, this hydraulic here presses down on this assembly, which moves this far down that pipe here and moves the spoiler in. So everything's controlled from this one section on each end of the broom. They should be about the same. You shouldn't really have any major coating. They should be pretty close to adjustment. If you're getting coating, I would let the, the uh, mechanics know and they can have a look at it for you. 
<laughs> Our new broom design, this was compared to the old broom design, which was 36 inches. We've now gone to a 46 inch diameter, one core for consistent performance. It's available in the way for our cassette. If for whatever reason you want to go to a cassette, we can actually pull the wafer right out, put a whole cassette core in there, and away you go. If it's in either machine, doesn't matter. You don't have to change anything. Uh, the larger 20 or 17 half inch uh, caster wheels on the broom. We have the largest broom caster wheels in the industry. Nobody else is running that size of wheel, which is basically a truck size tire, uh, which is designed to carry the weight of our broom at a high rate of speed. Increased performance and longevity. These are the benefits of having that, that new broom style. Uh, we can actually get or put the new broom style on your old machines that you have here. We've done it before in Calgary and uh, Chicago. Uh, which makes that machine updated and very similar to the ones all your fleet would be more cohesive per se if that was to be done. Uh, the new brooms can be placed in transfer position from either side, right or left, doesn't matter. The older ones was one way. Again, maximum broom speed up to 720 RPM. When we test these things at the factory, you're standing beside that brush and spinning at 720 RPM, it makes you take a step back. That's a lot of weight spinning at a high rate of speed. <coughs> Uh, the dolly itself, now you guys have changed these before, you're familiar with the broom change on these, is that correct? I mean, it's nothing really new to you guys, got the dolly. Uh, our broom cast wheels are the same on all these style brooms. Again, you got the, we got the trailing aspect because the actual uh, pivot point is in the middle, inside the frame here, and then your axle is here, so that distance is going to give us more of a trailing effect. We've got a little skid shoe on the bottom here in case that tire goes flat. You'll actually see the sparks, so somebody hopefully tells somebody else that there's sparks happening out there. And you got a broom uh, tire that's down. Uh, inside and outside uh, broom transport and work mode. So when the broom's in transport mode, this light is on. When you switch the broom to work mode, the exterior light comes on. So that's how you can tell from the outside whether or not the person's actually got their work light or not. Uh, the cast wheel settings have got a mechanical steering linkage in here to help the cast wheel to be aligned left or right, depending which way you want the room to be. Uh, the engines themselves, again, they, they're tier four final with no regen. We've got the depth. The aggregate engine, one thing that's unique is that our aggregate engine speed is at idle normally until you push the joystick forward. Then the plow goes down, broom goes down, aggregate engine comes up to full, operates. When you're done operating, go back to the joystick, it goes back to idle automatically you're not making any adjustments with that yourself it's all happening by itself so you're saving fuel and wear and tear on the engine uh, the engine oil levels can be checked and i can show you once we get outside same thing with the cooling levels I can show you that once we get out there uh, there's your air drain you can ever do that there's your hydraulic level indicator on the hydraulic tank it shows the actual temperature and level that's in the tank uh, we've got fueling. We can fuel from either side. So we've got a four inch hose across the bottom, which means we can fuel all, both tanks from one side. You don't have to use fill both sides. Uh, the death fluid itself, that's a whole other animal. Uh, it's, it's using, I don't know what your experience is here with your death tanks. Uh, do they typically fill the death uh, at the same time they put the fuel in? Or they, that's, yeah. Do they find, you know how much death you're using after 12 hours, let's say? Is it half, empty, quarter, no? Quarter, maybe not even that. Okay, that's gone or that's left? What's that? A quarter of a tank left or? You no, know, three quarters. Okay, three quarters used, okay. Um, again, the depth fluid. We've got now two Lincoln loop, loop systems, one on the back of the cab on the PSBs and one in the back rear section. They added the second one up front to give us more uh, greasing pressure to the front half of the machine as opposed to pumping it from all the way back to the front. Now there's two separate ones. So the one in the front works with the plow hitch and all the front greasing assemblies and one in the back works with the rear and the broom greasing assemblies. This is the biggest change we made to the machine going forward. What you're really going to sit here for today is to understand what we did to the cab. So this is a previous look at uh, the Vamos cab. <coughs> the older design, Scotty engines. Lots of wiper control, lots of switches everywhere. Everywhere you see there's a switch and a light. A little bit overwhelming when you first get in there to figure out what all this stuff means and what it does. Our task was to take all of these buttons and lights and switches and move it into this. So now you've got clear view in the front to the plow hitch down here.
You think that every bombs machine has? They're all identical? You got your transmission selection here. Now we've got the push button as opposed to a lever. Uh, your air brake release is here. Your aggregate engine key start is going to be there, and your drive engine is going to be on the steering column itself. On the top, up above the operator's head, you've got your wiper controls in the center. You've got the left side your lighting controls. On the right side, you've got more lighting controls and your heated windshield. On the left hand side, we've got our automatic uh, mirror control. We can control the top mirror, the low mirror. We can put heat to it or not, but that's all based on the left hand side uh, control panel. On the right hand side, we've got our heating and air conditioning located here. You make your settings. Now we're actually going to start up the machine and go out there and do some work with it. So here's the procedure that we would do to go out there and do work. First, you want to make sure you're in a safe operating area. You've got at least 30 meters clearance around the machine. Uh, and I recommend running the machine at high idle or operating speeds inside the barn. I've seen some guys do that, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's better to take it outside if you can run it up to speed. Here's a picture of the new can panel. This is everything that we have done to the can panel itself. I was fortunate enough to be directly involved with the electronic engineer that designed this. So we worked together to try to figure out what the operators really needed to see. We wanted to make the screen as clear as possible, not co convoluted with multiple colors, multiple things going on. If I needed to look at something, I could see it clearly and not have to squint or try to find out where the difference is. <coughs> so on the top left, we've got a speedometer here. Uh, it gives us our miles per hour. We've got our mileage down below here. Up on the top left is our uh, broom warm-up sequence that's done automatically based on ambient air temperature. Uh, so if it's below a certain temperature outside, it will go into the warm-up sequence automatically if it's been sitting outside. Uh, it's been sitting in the barn, you pull it out, it won't go into the sequence because it's been sitting at the 70 degrees or whatever it is inside your shop. Uh, this one here is going to turn green when the broom's actually spinning. On the right hand side, we've now got our air blower will turn green when the air blower is spinning. Our W means work light or work mode. So when that light comes on down here, you'll actually get a green W up there as well. So you know, have another way to confirm you've got the work light on. Um, this is gonna be your drive engine. There's your depth fluid, your fuel on board, the hours of the drive engine, and anything that pops up down here is gonna be that engine related, or related to that engine. So if there's an engine check light or a code for that engine, it's gonna show up a little bar that will come on down here. On the whole Volvo's machine, yellow is warning. If you see yellow light, it's a warning. If you see a red light, it's an it's a intimate, you've got to stop for immediately have a look at what that is. Below that, we've only got the death tank for the aggregate engine because the aggregate engine uses the same fuel tank as the drive engine on the PSB. This is a typical situation you're going to see when they started the drive engine and not started the aggregate engine. And we had it look like this because we wanted to, the engines are so far back, you don't always know if it's running or not. I've had operators get in the cab, start the drive engine, pull it out of the barn, try to make things work and nothing wants to work for them because you actually have to have the aggregate engine running before any hydraulics will work. So we wanted to make sure that that was clear they had not started it at that point. Is there a way you can turn off, like you can actually make the back, background black? For when? Uh, for night driving or? Yes, there is a, um, it's, uh, instead of it being gray like that. Right here, mm -hmm. when you hit that button, this goes into the night screen. Okay, good. So I've got a high and a low setting already programmed in it because I didn't want the operators to have to go, I gotta go here, I gotta go there, I gotta move this, I gotta get that to a dimmer screen. Right. So we already set up two settings and you'll see when we get outside what they are. Uh, and the daytime is bright and the nighttime is very dim. Uh, the bottom section down here, you're going to see the rear steering is located in automatic. In the bottom area, if there's an error code, it's going to pop up like this. So that's going to be your error code. A, it's yellow, so it's an active error code of some type. It's not a major one, but it is an active error code. You can press view what the error code is, and this pops up. Now it tells you you've got an aggregate engine uh, code number here, SPN number, which the mechanics can look up. Uh, I've also asked the engineering group to now tell me what that number is, as opposed to uh, having to go to mechanics, come back to the barn. Uh, I was doing some testing with the machine. I was out on the airfield we have at the factory. 
doing some testing. I got one of these codes. I'm looking at it. Okay, I got to go back to the barn and figure out what this is. I go back to the barn and figure out it was low coolant. So I could have topped it up in the field if I needed to, but I didn't know what that number was. So I said, the operators need to know what that number is so they can tell the mechanical group, I got a low coolant alarm, and they can either show up with coolant or whatever it is, depending where they are in the field. So you don't have to come all the way back to the barn based on a, a simple code like that. So you've got your drive engine, egg engine, after treatment for the drive and the aggregate, ABS system here, and there's your transmission alarms that come in this area here. On the bottom left hand corner we have the broom vibrator which controls the vibrator on the broom deck itself to vibrate the snow off the hood. We have your auto air suspension which should always be an automatic, I can adjust the air suspension. And then we have four wheel drive and two wheel drive and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but this one here has got our broom RPM so when you first start up the broom it's going to sit at about a thousand. It's going to tell you it's got like 700 and something PSI. That's the pressure, the hydraulic pressure that's going to the broom that's driving the brush. So that number is always going to be moving dramatically, uh, depending on what you're doing, how you're doing, what speed you're traveling. Because the faster you travel, the more broom speed it's going to give you automatically. Down below here is something that you did not have before, and that's actually the broom diameter. So the operator can actually see the broom diameter from his position to know that it's actually making adjustments as he goes. So a new broom starts at 1170, you get in your shift, you look at the broom diameter, 1170, and at the end of your shift, you look at it and it says 1160. Well then, hey, you know what, it's just made adjustments throughout my whole shift like it's supposed to do. So you can't say that it's not making adjustments, so it's trying to keep up with the wear of the brush itself. Um, and now we'll come into another screen a little bit later. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah. Drive engine key located on the steering column. Aggregate engine key over on the right side. Once you get the engines running, we start looking at what how to make the machine operate. So what does it M mean on the screen? It means manual. So when you hit manual, it automatically gives you the plow control. Because in the violence world, when you hit manual, the only thing you're going to work manually is going to be the, the plow hitch. And I want to pick up the plow. Okay. So once you squeeze the button, you're going to have manual control immediately of the plow hitch, provided drive your engine's running. It's used to disconnect the plow. This is what it's going to look like on the screen. A, you've got your work light here, work light there. You select an M, it's giving you the plow automatically. And here's a big green box to show you the pins are currently in the locked position on the hitch, which you can also see from the cabin. Okay. So that's going to give you an indication of the, of the pins on the hitch itself. The joystick has two buttons on it, one on the top and one on the bottom. To work your, jo your pins on the hitch, you squeeze those two buttons together at the same time and hold them and then the pins will go in. So now we're not reaching around for another switch and trying to make things happen down below here. It's all happening right from the joystick. There's also the plow manual button that every bombless machine has. You squeeze the button in the front here and it gives you that manual plow control as you go. So that's the same as every other bounce that's out there. Here's a shot of the pins in the unlocked position. When you squeeze it, when you let it go, that's going to show the default is locked. So as soon as you let the joystick go, the pins come in. Yes? Is there like a safety switch so that if you're in motion, the guys actually squeeze it, the pins don't unlock? It has to be in manual for it to work. So just just checking. That's the that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. See that drive. You yeah. Drive yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all up on two two. Oh. Uh, because it's the manual switch here has to be on to initiate any of the pin action. So when the, when you switch over to automatic, which we'll get to in a moment, now that front button works the plow manual, and that's it. So you can squeeze the two and nothing put out. Uh, transport mode, what does that mean? Well, in the Vamos world, it's not cradle, it's not stow, it's transport. So where's the broom? It's in transport. We're going to get it out of transport. We hit the letter T. It's going to give us the broom and the, and the blower and take the, the plow off. Because we're done. We picked up the plow, we got it. Now we want to get the broom out and use that. So it allows the operator to focus on what they have to do at the different times to get everything working together. So once the two come on together, you'll be able to move the joystick to get the broom out of the transport and into the work mode. The air, the air blower, although not physically moving, is actually getting set up in the back as well. 
So here you can see we've got the transport button selected. We've got it's turned on the sweeper, the blower, and we're going to be looking for a light in the center. But what do we do? We got to move that joystick. We got to move it all the way back and to the left, which is leave the cradle, or all the way back and to the right, which is return. So left leave, right return. And that you hold that position when you're taking the broom out. You hold that position until that light comes on, or you see that green light up on top. They are tied together. All right. That's very important. If you don't get that light, nothing's going to happen for you, or things will work differently, and you have some challenges. If you have any kind of problem with sequencing or anything with the machine, or you turn the broom off or the air blower off, and you can't get it to come back on or whatever, always come back to just this: transport back left, wait for the light to come on, it resets everything in the system, and you go back to. So this is the basis of everything. <clears throat> Automatic mode. We've got the plow on, we've got the broom out, we've got the work light on. How do we want to use the machine? We want to use it in automatic. We press that button, we're going to get all the functions of the joystick, provided we have the yellow light on. Uh, here we go. So we got automatic comes on, you get the sweeper, the blower, and the plow all come together. To get the broom to spin, you take the joystick and move it to the left or the right, and then the broom will start to spin automatically. I always move it left, then right, or right, then left, just to make sure the plow is moving, the broom is moving, everything's spinning and working together and ready to go to work. I've seen a lot of people get in the cab and uh, switch on the automatic and leave it. And they go in the field, the broom isn't spinning yet. And it won't start spinning until you make your selection left or right. Now you've been up there working for 12 hours, you're gonna come back and you're gonna put everything away. So what do you want to put away? The first thing you want to do is take the broom and put it back in the, in the transport position. So select the letter T, gives you these two buttons. Again, turns off the plow, also shuts down the broom rotation as soon as you press the letter T. See the broom rotation will stop, air floor rotation stops. Now we take our joystick. Here's what it's going to look like. Transport, these two come on, plow goes off. We're out of automatic and manual right now. We're going to grab the joystick all the way back and right return. And we hold it in that position until these lights and this light go out. No matter how it feels or what it does back there, hold it until those lights go out. And you'll be home. And you don't have to push the joystick forward to put it on the, on the cradle. It does it just by back and right. That's it. The old Scotty ones, you got to set it down, but these ones you don't. This is the final screen that you're going to see when you turn off the keys. You turn off both keys in the panel. This screen's going to